Good morning. My name is Johanna Sepulveda. I'm going to chair the, the second session on post-quantum cryptography in software. Uh, we have two uh, very interesting talks. The first one is oil and vinegar, vinegar, modern parameters and implementations, and it is going to be presented by Matthias Cambisha. Thank you very much for the introduction. So this is joint work with uh, my colleagues in Taiwan and Switzerland, and I'm going to talk about a, a very long paper on oil and vinegar. So as we've seen in many talks, or chess already, NIST has recently re released draft standards for post-quantum crypto. So basically, we're done right now, right? No, uh, actually, we're continuing this process, and that's because some applications can really benefit from different performance character characteristics than what these lattice space and hash based schemes can give you. So for example, there there is code based camps that can, can give you small cipher texts and, and large public keys, which is sometimes preferable than a lattice scheme that has like medium cipher texts and medium public keys. So that's why NIST keeps studying code based camps in, in the in the fourth round of evaluation. Another another uh, spot in this performance spectrum is is signatures that have small signatures and large public keys, which can be very useful if you don't have to transmit the public key and can just need to need to send the, the signature. And an example for this is MQ signatures. So, and that's what NIST wants from another competition they recently started, where they asked for additional signatures that can kind of complement the, the lattice space and hash based signatures that we have now already. So MQ has been has been around for a while. So actually in the first NIST competition, there were already six submissions based on MQ, but somehow they, after they got submitted in, in 2017, they one after the other got broken in 2019, 2020, and then the, the last one, Rainbow died in, in 2022. So that at the end of this NIST competition, all of the MQ schemes there were broken, which is kind of sad because sometimes you really want the small signature. And what's even more unfortunate is that no one bothered to submit a scheme that is around since the 90s and is not broken. And that's, that's oil and vinegar or unbalanced oil and vinegar. But yeah, every, all the submission teams had their more advanced constructions, which looked very good. They had much better performance characteristics than oil and vinegar, but unfortunately, they're all broken. So that's why we come back to oil and vinegar here. And... Um, the history goes back to, to 1997, where the scheme was originally proposed. Unfortunately, the original parameters were not secure, so there was an attack shortly after. But if you choose the parameters differently and get to something that's called unbalanced oil and vinegar, the scheme is still secure. And recently, uh, shortly afterwards, then a, a multi-layered oil and vinegar was proposed called Rainbow. Unfortunately, that is now also broken. But the original unbalanced oil and vinegar, as it was proposed in 99, still remains unbroken until today. So all of these, these attacks on the more advanced schemes don't, um, don't break UV. So UV is the only survivor of these old MQ schemes. And none of the attacks here attack this structure. So in this work, we kind of revisit oil and vinegar. We, we select parameters that that are like taking into account all the, the attacks over the years. And we select these parameters in a way to get good performance on a wide range of, of hardware. So small CPUs, large CPUs, and hardware is what we, we look at in, in this work. We propose, as usual, three security levels, level one, three, and five in, in the NIST competition. And we think that probably security level one is the one that's, that's most relevant for most applications. That's why we dare actually give two options. One is, is 1S, which is optimized for a signature for the signature size, and one is called 1P, which is optimized for the public key size. And then for a signature optimized one, you get 96 byte signatures, but you have a little bit larger public key. Whereas for the public key optimized one, you get 128, 128 byte signatures with about 44 kilobytes of compressed public keys. So yeah, very small signatures, but somewhat massive public keys. We propose three variants. It's kind of similar to what you what you saw in, in Rainbow. The team is, also has a very large overlap. So we have one that's called Classic that has 
no compression at all, which gives you the best performance for signing and verification, but it has a huge public key. So you at the at security level one, you get that 280 kilobytes public key, which is quite big. That's why there is there's tricks to to improve that. That's what's called public key compression. So we call these parameter sets PKC, where some part of the public key is sampled from a seed. And that gives you the same signing speed because it only affects the public key, but it gives you slower verification because you first have to sample this part of the public key. But then you end up at public keys that are much smaller. In this case, it can get as small as 44 kilobytes. There's a third variant that we call SKC, where the secret key is also sampled from seed, and then you get very, very small secret keys, which sometimes can be can be useful if you only have a very, very um, small secure storage in your device or so. And in this paper, we, in addition to proposing these parameters, we present implementations for AVX2, ARM Neon, and ARM Cortex M4, and FPGA. So it's a very long implementation paper that um, kind of presents state-of-the-art implementations. And, and many of these tricks have been in, in rainbow literature or other, other MQ literature, but we just put it all together so that we have a, a full set of implementations. The implementations are actually all open source and, and public domain, so you can go to this repository and download them and use them. And in the meantime, we've also submitted this to the to NIST, to NIST for standardization. So there's a website now can look at the specification. It's essentially what is described in our paper, but we have a, another repository for the code for that, which is because we we did some, some experiments in the paper where we compared different approaches and that's still in the in the first repository, but we, we threw that out and only took the best approaches for the submission to NIST. So that's why there's two repositories. Okay, so now we can very briefly go over what the scheme is. So if you want to instantiate oil and vinegar, you need to need to pick some parameters. One is n, which will be the set of uh, the number of variables. One is m, that is the number of equations that you will have. So I'll, I put some some parameters here so that you already can imagine how large these, these things are going to be. So n for the for one parameter set is going to be 112 and m is going to be 44. Then we need to pick a finite field. We use either F16 or F256 for our parameter sets. So these, these characteristic two fields give us very good um, performance on, on many platforms. So that's why they're, they're commonly used here. To do key generation, we, we sample two transformations. One is a linear invertible transformation T mapping from, from n elements in this field to n elements and the other is a an invertible central and invert quadratic invertible what's called a central map that is mapping from n elements to m elements and then the public key is computed as a composition of these two maps so that um it's hard to invert that and the private key is then these these two individual maps and uh, the public key is the composition composition of these two maps if I want to sign a message now, I first hash this message to, to a vector of field elements, of m field elements, and then I kind of invert this, this map. So I, I first invert q and invert t so that I get a pre-image for our, our message hash. So if I apply the, the public map to the signature, I will get the hash of the message. And that's what verification is doing. So we compute this hash and then apply the public map, and this should... So apply the public map to the signature, and that gives you the same as this, this W. And now kind of, so that's kind of similar for many MQ schemes. And the interesting part is really this, the central map Q and the way um, oil and vinegar is constructing that is, is using this set of um, equations where you have what, what's called vinegar variables and oil variables and the vinegar variables are, are mixed with all other variables but the oil variables are only mixed with vinegar variables and this way we can um we can have the set of equations and if we want to sample a, a pre-image for that then we will pick the first v's or the vinegar variables at random which gives us a, a linear li set of linear equations which we can solve 
using Gaussian illumination, for example, and that gives us gives us a way to invert this map. So the, the parameters we've selected are here, here on the slide. So for the smallest parameters, we end up at like, in the classic version, it's like 280 kilobytes or 412 kilobytes of public key. But we can compress this down to like 44 kilobytes or 66 kilobytes. And for the for the larger parameter sets, it can get quite big to like 2.9 kilobytes. Okay, so what else did we, is kind of new in this work. Um, one thing that you will notice is that if you use these compressed variants for compressing the public key, you will do a lot of hashing. So you need to somehow expand a small seed into a large random looking matrix that's like 230 kilobytes or even, even more than two megabytes for some parameter sets. So this kind of sounds like you want to use a XOF for this, but performance of Shake is, is kind of not great on, on these, these platforms. That's why Shake is not commonly used for that. Instead, what, what we propose to use here is to use AS128 in uh, counter mode. And on, on big CPUs, this is, this is great. You can make use of AS instructions, um, so that's really fast. On small CPUs, you can uh, use T-table implementations because this is all public data, so we don't really care about leaking anything through a cache side channel. So using T-table implementation is, is fine for that. Also important here, by using AES in counter mode, we can sample output at arbitrary positions in our in 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 the stream, and this allows us to do some tricks um, because we we don't need all of the public keys. So depending on the signature, we can only sample some of the public key that we actually need to to compute, and that's quite nice for for low RAM implementation and hardware implementation because this this AS takes a lot of time and if we then don't have to sample all of it it's it makes it a, a bit faster and that wouldn't be possible if we would use a standard XOS or something actually we we propose some more tricks because we think um, like a standard AS 10 round is maybe a little bit overkill because we don't really need a cryptographically secure randomness here we just need something that's sufficiently random. So we propose an, some additional parameter sets that use four round AES for this. And since four round AES instead of 10 rounds, it's like two and a half times faster. It results in like a factor two speed up in, in verification for these compressed parameter sets. And some context, there have been recent discussions on in, in Kyber and Delithium and such to replace Shake with of turbo shake, so essentially um, lowering shake from, from 24 rounds to 12 rounds. And everyone seems to agree that this is the right thing to do. It's secure enough, we should do it. But NIST said, no. So it's not going to happen now. And we kind of want to start this discussion much earlier for, for UV, because if we propose it earlier, maybe there is a higher chance that this will be adopted in a standard. Thing. So we hope that this approach is, is going to be more successful and we we will end up with a standard that at least considers this another thing we looked at in this work is is um blocked inversion or um how to solve this the set of linear equations so we need to solve this this set of linear equations in constant time and there are basically two options in the literature one is just using constant time gaussian el elimination that directly solves the equations and another option is to use matrix inversion and then followed by a matrix vector multiplication. And previous work, actually a paper last year at Chess, proposed to use the second approach so that we can use some tricks to make this matrix inversion faster some, by using something called blocked matrix inversion. And um, yeah, there was a paper last year by Shim Lee and Ko that uh, shows that this is great. It, it makes the matrix inversion much faster but we actually revisit that in this work and, and look at this option one, because we thought if you just look at the asymptotics, if you count multiplications in these two approaches, the first one takes much less than the, the second. So if you, if you count multiplications for the second option, the matrix inversion, you will need like five over eight M cubed multiplications, where it, for just solving it directly, you will need a third M cubed multiplication. So asymptotically, it, it looks like the first option is much better, and we confirm that on all platforms that we're 
studying here, that's actually the case. So you should not use matrix inversion. And there is another reason to not do it. And that is this blocked matrix inversion only works if the sub matrices that, that you're inverting are also, also invertible. And that's something that restricts um, the scheme. So you would have to write this into the specification that the sub matrices have to be invertible. And if they're not, then you have to restart and sample a, a new set of integer variables. And that's why it's kind of not a trick that we want to have in the spec because it makes the spec kind of ugly. And that's why it's good that we now show it, it, it doesn't actually help us anyway. So we can just keep it out of the spec and keep the spec clean. Okay, I don't have much, much time to go into all the details of what the implementations are doing, but I will give very brief overview of what the new things are in this work. And then you can, can read the paper to see, see the rest. So I'll start with AVX2. So here, actually the core arithmetic can be taken from previous rainbow implementations. So there's, there's not much um, new to add here. So what you will be using for the finite field arithmetic is, is the shuffle instructions, which basically do an, an, a table lookup inside of an AVX registry. For that, you will need to generate multiplication tables. And we show some faster methods of doing that in, in the paper. And then that gives us state-of-the-art implementations. And in the paper, we, we show results for both Haswell and, and Skylake. And yeah, I, don't, I won't go through all the, the numbers here, but what we can see is that if we use the compressed public keys, this will give us a slower verification by a factor of four to seven. So keep this number in mind, because here actually we have AS instructions. So there we can do the sampling relatively fast. But on the other platforms, we will see it the, the performance penalty for, for using this compression is, is much higher. What we can also see is that actually the uncompressed variants are faster than the lithium. So the performance for, for signing and verification of this is, is very, very fast. For neon, uh, we also study the, the finite field arithmetic. There are basically two options to do that. You can either use table lookups as well. So there's instructions similar to AVX2 to do intra, intra register table lookups. But there's actually also dedicated instructions for F2 arithmetic. Um, so we study which ones are better for, for F16. It's, it's fairly obvious that the, the dedicated instructions are better for, for the F256. We compare the two approaches and there it's actually depends on on how often you can reuse your multiplication tables because this this generation of the multiplication tables is, is a little bit more expensive and then actually it depends on the the sizes that you're using so in different places inside of the scheme we use either of the two approaches looking at the results um i only have the a72 results here in the paper we also have apple m1 results but we see that the uh, the compressed public keys increase the verification time by 26 to 36 times. So here it's a lot um, slower to use this, this compressed public keys. And the reason for that is that this core doesn't have AS instructions. So you have to do it in software and that, that costs a lot. For the uncompressed variants, we again see that the performance is better than the lithium. So again, we get very, very fast performance. Third platform we looked at is the, the ARM Cortex M4. Here we again study the, the field arithmetic for F16. This has been done before um, for rainbow implementation. So that can just be been taken from that. And it's a, it's a bit sliced arithmetic, which works the, in the same way. For F256, um, it's basically the AS field. So we thought that maybe we can just reuse some of the bit sliced AS implementations. But actually it turns out that since we are always doing vector by scalar multiplications here, we can do much better than, than what's there for AS. We propose two methods to do that. One is a bit sliced that is very close to what's done for F16. And the other is a byte slice. So you pack four elements in a word and then do everything on, on that. And we show that the latter is actually superior to, to um, the bit slice one. One observation that we made right while while doing this work is that in the verification, if an element in the signature is actually zero, then there is a large part of the public key that we don't actually need for verification. And 
we can exploit that by not sampling all of the public key. So um, by using AS128, this is wrong on the slide, should be 128, in counter mode, we can, can just skip ahead and in advance the counter and only sample the parts of the public key we really need. And since AS is quite slow on this platform, this saves us a lot of time. But it requires a slightly non-standard API for, for AS and counter mode, because usually the, the AS counter mode, you don't really get the counter as an argument. You just give it the length that you want. Looking at the results, we can only present results for security level one, because other, for the bigger ones, we, we don't have any CPUs that, that have enough, any development boards that have enough RAM. We see again that we pay a huge price for this, this compression, both for, for signing and for verification. And um, yeah, so here you really benefit from using a, a round reduced AS. But again, if you look at the uncompressed variants, you get a scheme that's faster than the lithium. So it's the performance for the uncompressed variants is, is really, really fast. The last implementation that uh, we have is an FPGA implementation. So there we implement key generation signing and verification on an FPGA. And again, the focus here is on the, the finite field arithmetic. And there we actually observed that for F256, it would be better to use a different field representation, so a tower field representation. But um, changing that would require to change the spec, and then it would be slower on the M4. So that's by in the end, we decided to go for the, the for this for the representation that we have now. So no tower fields. The way we implement this is a custom instruction set architecture, which makes this entire core more more reusable for other things and also more manageable in terms of code. And the hardware itself is a systolic array, which allows us to have um, pretty high utilization but still have an, a design that's, that's routable. And we can actually operate the arithmetic and the AES in parallel, which gives us a, a high throughput. So we have two um, designs. I'll, I'll not uh, go through numbers, but we have one design that, that is um, for low area and one that is for high performance. And you can, can look in the paper and, and the details. So let me conclude this talk. So we present modern instantiations of oil and vinegar. We think the security level one is probably most interesting for most. So we have two variants, one that optimizes for small signatures, which will give you a 96 byte signature, which is much smaller than, than anything else that exists. Public keys there in the compressed variants will be 66 kilobytes. The, the public key size optimized parameters will end up with, with like 128 byte signatures with smaller public keys of 44 kilobytes. We provide open source implementations for AVX, ARM Neon, ARM Cortex M4, and FPGA. So we have a complete set of all the, the platforms that, that NIST and, and many people care about. So I think we're in a, in a pretty good state even before submitting it to NIST. The implementation performance is competitive with state-of-the-art lattice-based schemes. The arithmetic itself is super fast. The expensive part is really the, the AS that you need to do. So if you have AS in hardware, that helps you a lot. And I think that oil and vinegar is probably the most conservative choice that we have in this new signature competition, except for maybe the hash-based schemes that, that also got submitted here. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Matthias. I think we have uh, time for one question. Yes, please, here. So you said in order to use a different field representation, you would need to change the spec and there's trade-offs between different platforms. But mapping between one representation and another seems like it's a pretty cheap operation, right? So is the advantage so small that it's not yeah. worth Okay, so it's There's, really tiny. It's really tiny advantage. Yeah, then. yeah. The, the 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 advantage is not not big. There we have a paragraph on that in the paper. We considered it, but it's not worth it. Okay. And on on M four, you really don't want the the tower field. So there, the the difference is bigger. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
So thank you so much, Matthias. If you have more questions, you can reach him later on. Please thank the speaker again. And now we go to the second uh, presentation of the session. It is entitled uh, Formally Verifying Kyber, Episode 4, Implementation Correctness. And it's going to be presented by Miguel Cuaresma. Please, Miguel. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, formally verifying uh, Kyber. Uh, this is the first episode of several. Uh, and in this case, we focus on implementation correctness. This is joint work with uh, several people from ENRIA, Max Planck Institute, University of Porto, and certainly some more that I'm forgetting. So uh, what's the motivation behind uh, trying to verify Kyber? So formal methods uh, in cryptography or in high assurance cryptography give us several properties uh, that we consider desirable. These properties include functional correctness, where we can uh, implement a primitive and reason about this primitive with respect to some property that we would like it to hold, and security properties such as memory safety so that we can ensure that there's no out-of-bounds access, uh, for, exa for example, and uh, that uh, our code has no timing leaks. However, the use of formal methods uh, presents a cost. And we believe that uh, the migration to post-quantum cryptography is an opportunity for us to introduce what we call, or what we name a new generation of high assurance uh, post-quantum cryptography, where uh, the primitives are, or these implementations are formally verified uh, by default. So what are our contributions? Well, the main one is a formally verified implementation of Kyber, uh, actually two. Uh, and this includes a formal specification of Kyber, uh, written in EasyCrypt, uh, that uh, the main goal is for it to be human auditable. And I'll explain uh, a bit further uh, what this means. We also provide two implementations of the Kyber 768 uh, parameter set. Uh, these implementations are written in the Jasmine language. Uh, and they are a, a reference implementation and a vectorized implementation, both targeting uh, AMD64. And then we also provide computer verified proofs of correctness for these implementations. Uh, oh. uh, in addition to this, uh, and while we were doing this work, uh, it was pretty evident that the current uh, tooling uh, wasn't uh, able to accomplish the task that we, we were trying to accomplish. And therefore, we also provide improvements to existing formal verification tools, namely the Jasmine framework and uh, EasyCrypt, uh, the EasyCrypt proof assistant. And finally, because uh, correctness uh, is not the only thing that we care about, we also provide comparative benchmarks uh, with other implementations, uh, namely the, the code package provided by the Kyber team. And we show that uh, our implementations are competitive uh, in this regard. So just to give a summary of uh, what Kyber is, it is a module LWE-based NCCA2 secure chem. It was selected by NIST for uh, standardization after the round three of uh, the post-quantum competition. And it has several design goals, uh, and I I'm just highlighting a couple here, uh, namely efficient constant time implementation, which obviously we care for in this work, efficient vectorization, which is well important if you're trying to obtain an optimized implementation through these means, and low memory consumption on embedded platforms. Now, as I mentioned, we use two tools to accomplish this task. Uh, we use the uh, Jasmine and EasyCrypt. And uh, some of you are probably already familiar with these tools. Uh, Peter talked about them in his uh, talk on Monday. But I'll just go, uh, go over a brief overview of what they are. So Jasmine is a framework for developing efficient high assurance cryptography. How do we achieve this? Well, the efficiency part is achieved through low-level features, so things that you'd get in assembly, such as the ability to register, to allocate registers, and the ability to directly select the instruction that the compiler produces once uh, you compile your code to assembly. But unlike assembly, we get some nice features that you would uh, expect from a higher-level language, such as functions, arrays, and control flow structures, namely while loops, for loops, and if clauses. Now. This is not very important for this talk, but I would just like to point out that, for example, this for loop is actually an abstraction that the compiler provides that gets uh, enrolled uh, or unrolled uh, at compile time. Uh, 
so it has no overhead. Another thing that Jasmine provides is that it includes a formally verified compiler uh, using the Coq proof assistant. Uh, and this gives us two nice properties. The first one being that uh, the code that you write in Jasmine is proven to semantically uh, or to, uh, to be semantically preserved in the assembly that is produced by the compiler. And the second one is uh, constant time preservation. So what this means is that uh, if your code is constant time when you write it in Jasmine, it will also be constant time when, you, uh, when it's compiled down to assembly. In the high assurance part, we get from the ability to extract this code, this Jasmine code, to an easy crypt model. And this is what uh, our proofs and uh, our lemmas are about. So we are able to reason about Jasmine programs using the easy crypt proof system. And as I said, it was pretty clear that uh, these tools were missing some features. And uh, these are some of the highlights of the features that we added to Jasmine. So we have local functions. So functions that whose uh, body doesn't get inline at compile time. We have subarrays. We have array pointers, and we have uh, random bytes, which is a, a primitive that allows us to generate fresh randomness from within the Jasmine code instead of re uh, relying on a, an outside source to get this randomness from. So EasyCrypt is the other tool that we use. This is what we actually uh, use to prove things, and it is a proof assistant focused on correctness and security proofs, uh, mainly focused on cryptographic primitives. And for us, it allows us to reason about easy crypt code that we extract from our Jasmine code. Specifically, we can reason about the functional correctness of a specific function or scheme with respect to a specification that we write in easy crypt. And we can also reason about equivalence between easy crypt procedures. So if you have two functions in Jasmine and you want to prove that they do the same thing, you can extract them to easy crypt and reason about this. And similar to Jasmine, there were also uh, some missing features in, in uh, easy crypt, uh, namely some standard library additions, such as the ab uh, ability to reason about polynomial rings, the ability to infer functional operators from imperative specifications, and some improved support for handling nested loops uh, when you're uh, reason about a procedure. Okay, so with this in mind, what did we actually do? So we provide two implementations in Jasmine, a reference implementation and an AVX2 implementation. And these get compiled to assembly. Uh, and as I said, this compilation is certified. Uh, and just to point out, uh, in the following diagrams, uh, dashed lines represent things that we get by default without any extra work. So we don't need to prove that the assembly actually preserves the semantic properties of the code. We then take these Jasmine implementations and we are able to extract them uh, to EasyCrypt. And this is what we are going to reason about. Uh, we can either reason about them with respect to a specification, or as I said, we can prove that these are functionally equivalent. So we take this Jasmine reference implementation and we prove that it correctly implements an easy crypt specification of the Kyber scheme. So how does this look like? Well, we write an easy crypt specification of the Kyber scheme that matches uh, the Kyber proposal. This, again, the main idea is that it, easy, it is easy to audit and therefore, uh, it should be easy to detect any mistakes. Then for the reference implementation, we take a bottom-up approach. So we start by proving that the field operations in, these, uh, in this implementation are correct. Then we prove that the polynomial rings that build on top of this, or the operations on polynomial rings that build on top of this are also correct. And then if all the underlying blocks are correct, then we can prove that a cam that builds on top of these blocks should also be correct. For the optimized implementation, the approach had to be a bit different. So the reference implementation's main goal is to be fairly close to the spec. So we don't care about performance, uh, but on the optimized implementation, this is not the case. So what we actually want, uh, or what ends up happening is that this code vastly differs in structure from what you see in a specification. And therefore this requires us to prove equivalence to a reference implementation that should be much closer to the optimized implementation uh, and then correctness of the scheme follows by transitivity, by the transitive property. So if we can prove that the, the reference implementation is correct, then if the optimized implementation is equivalent, then it should be correct, uh, as I said, by the transitive property. And so this is, I guess, an overview of what we've done. We get two Jasmine implementations. These get compiled down to assembly. This is certified, so we know that they do what we expect them to do. And then we extract these to an easy crypt model and we can check that this easy or this easy crypt model implements a spec of Kyber that we uh, that we wrote. 
So I said that uh, one of the main goals of this EasyCruise specification is that it is easily audible, uh, auditable and that it matches the spec. And so here I have uh, on the left, I have uh, the Kyber specification or the EasyCruise specification for the Kyber CPA construction of the encryption algorithm. And on the, on the right-hand side, I have the, the same algorithm, but that is present in the Kyber proposal. And as you can see, these are pretty similar. They match uh, almost line by line if you ignore the variable declarations on the EasyCrypt uh, Easy side. So you have a while loop that generates the matrix A. You have another loop that generates uh, a vector of small coefficients from a binomial distribution, another uh, loop that does the exact same thing. And then you have some NTT multiplications some encodings and you output the ciphertext. So, I mean, looking at this, uh, if you know the syntax of EasyCrypt, it should be fairly easy uh, to note that there's not, not anything that differs major from, from these two uh, specifications. So what do you do with the specification? Well, you write proofs about it. Uh, and I think uh, instead of proving the whole scheme, I thought I would show you how a proof for a simple function like polynomial addition uh, is written. So again, on the left-hand side here, we have a Jasmine, uh, the Jasmine implementation for the polynomial addition. Uh, this basically takes two, pointer, uh, two pointers to the Jasmine stack, and it adds these uh, polynomials coefficient-wise without performing any modular reduction. On the right-hand side, uh, it's simply the extracted EasyCrypt model for this, uh, for this implementation. So again, this is something that we get for free. Then we take this EasyCrypt uh, specification for this procedure and we prove something about it. So in this case, we have a, a, a lemma in EasyCrypt called poly add core under, uh, underscore H. This uses whore logic to prove that some, if some precondition holds, in this case, this precondition states that uh, uh, if we lift these, poly, these uh, arrays, this word arrays to polynomials, uh, and if we if the coefficients on these polynomials are within some bound, then after running this procedure, the poly add two, we get a polynomial whose coefficients are within some bound, and whose uh, uh, whose coefficients are congruent with the result of adding the the polynomial coefficients uh, modulo q. And the basic uh, logic for an easy quick proof in this case would be to state uh, an invariant for this loop. You prove that this invariant holds for all iterations of the of the loop, and then uh, the the post condition of this lemma follows uh, fairly easily uh, uh, as a result. Okay, so I've talked about what we've done, but uh, it's important to point out some caveats uh, of of uh, of our work. Namely, what is in the trusted computing base that we trust uh, that is without any uh, further guarantees? So first of all, first of all, we need EasyCrypt. So we trust that EasyCrypt is correct, uh, that it is sound, and we trust the results of the SMT solvers that are used for EasyCrypt. So these SMT solvers, we don't check their results, uh, and they're not necessarily formally verified. We also have to trust the cockproof assistant. Uh, because this is what we use to prove that the compiler preserves the semantics of, of the code that we write. We have to trust the translation from Jasmine to EasyCrypt, uh, and in, and specifically for these for this translation, we have to trust two things. We have to trust that the Coq instruction semantics for the x86 operations are correct. We have to trust that the EasyCrypt spec uh, uh, specification for these instructions are also correct, and we have to trust that these two specifications match semantically. And finally, we have to trust our easy proof specification because uh, if we specify something that we don't want to prove, well, then we get a proof that actually doesn't uh, tell us what we need to know. Furthermore, there's also some limitations to the proofs uh, or to the, the work that we've done. So we assume that the SHA-3 implementations that we use for generating noise or generating the matrix A are correct. And we have no proof for this fully vectorized implementation. So what we actually do is that uh, the benchmarks that we're gonna see are for this, we call it the fully verified implementation where we replace the rejection sampling used in the matrix generation with a, with the reference, implement, uh, with a reference implementation of this uh, same function, the rejection sampling. So what do we get as a result? We get some pretty competitive performance. So on the bottom here, we have the fully optimized implementation. So the one that uses the optimized uh, rejection sampling, but that isn't fully verified. And on the top, we have the, the C implementation 
uh, and we're around 10%, within 10% of the performance that uh, you'd get on the C implementation. Now on the fully verified implementation, we obviously get much worse performance. So we're around 50% or 100% slower than these implementations. And this is to be expected uh, because the matrix generation uh, in Kyber is actually due to the, the use of functions like the shake uh, extendable output function is one of the biggest uh, co-rips in performance. Okay, so we have a good performance, but uh, there's some limit, uh, limitations to our work. So what, what are we currently doing? Well, we're working on integrating the formal proofs of correctness for, uh, uh, for the SHA-3 functions that we use. We're working on extending the correctness uh, of the proofs of, or the correctness proofs to other Kyber implementations. This includes the fully optimized implementation, other Kyber parameter sets, uh, Kyber implementations that are Spectre V1 protected, although this shouldn't be much work. And we need to link the correctness proofs that we have with the security proof of Kyber uh, in EasyCrypt. So therefore we have a full uh, chain. So we go from uh, an assembly implementation up to a security proof of, of, of a scheme. And if you're interested in this sort of work, you can check out uh, Peter's talk uh, that he gave on Monday, High Assurance Crypto in Practice. So what does this mean? Well, there's some episodes incoming. We have uh, episode five. Well, we uh, will prove the NCPA security proof for the Kyber scheme. We have episode six, where we uh, will prove the NCCA2 security proof of the Kyber chem. And we hopefully have a Rogue One episode where we fill in some gaps that we might have left uh, at this work. So if you're interested in checking out some of the work that we're doing, you can check out the Formosa Crypto Project. Uh, it's the umbrella project. Our paper is already on imprint, of course. And uh, we have this cryptographic library that focuses on uh, post-quantum implementations that are formally verified, uh, plus some symmetric primitives uh, that you can check out called libjade. Uh, and that's my talk. Thank you so much, Miguel. Do we have any questions? No questions? So let, let me ask you one question. Um, currently, you report the performance of the different implementation. Do you, uh, have you explored about the uh, memory footprint uh, uh, of them? No, no, so we, we, we haven't uh, done any analysis on this memory footprint. Uh, we also don't optimize for, so that because this is targeting AMD64 and uh, some embedded system, we haven't really focused on this uh, beyond what these code packages already provide. Okay, thank you so much. Another question? Yes, please. Sir. Hi, a great talk, thank you. Um, you said that the uh, rejection sampling is only proven in the C implementation, right? How did you go about proving that? Because as far as I know, you can't really prove that it terminates. So we, there's a proof of termination uh, that uh, Peter and Manuel wrote. I think it's on ePrint, uh, but I think this only holds under, uh, like it. you can't prove that it terminates before the, I, I don't know exactly the conditions that it terminates, but there's a proof of termination for this rejection sampling on ePrint. I think if, you, if you're interested, you can talk to Peter and Manuel about that. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, so thank you so much again for your presentation. And I think with this, we close the session. <laughs> Bye. Uh, I'm going to